Okay, today we're talking about social media um, and how to stay safe on it. But as always, and my view is it's better to start going back to the beginning and get an understanding of what we're talking about rather than just leaping in. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to say, well, what is social media? The different kinds of social media and the various apps that there are. Um, I don't think I know anybody who is in, on every possible kind of social media, but there are just so many ways of connecting these days. Um, and the issue of who we're connecting to, are they actually who they say they are? That's quite an important one. Um, we'll be looking at the difference between intent and impact. In other words, what you mean to say and what other people take you as saying. We'll look very briefly at what happens when you erase posts. Can you actually delete something that you've accidentally posted? And we'll very briefly look at privacy settings and how to check them because every single social media platform and app has got different settings. Some of them are very helpful in helping you to lock your data down. Some of them, it's almost as if they don't want you to lock data down. However, let's just start at the very beginning. Social media is absolutely fantastic. Uh, for many people, it has been how they have stayed as sane as they have stayed, but have stayed sane during, the, during lockdown. It's how they keep in touch with people. It's great. Social media is absolutely awful because it exposes you and what you're saying and doing to all kinds of things. Um, and unless you're careful, it can do a huge amount of damage. It allows communication, but you've got to decide to whom you're communicating, what it is you're communicating, and what credence you place on what you are reading. Um, I read a number of social, economic, and political uh, sites and blogs, and sometimes I just about want to fall off my seat laughing at the stupidity of some of what's going on out there. Without some degree of security and awareness, social media can be dangerous. If you're not careful, you expose yourselves to all kinds of things. Once you are careful, it is a lifesaver. It's a godsend. It's one of the best things that we've come across. The background to it, of course, is that people have always met to chat. We are social animals. We are a pack animal. We always like to, to sit and chat, um, to, to chat over coffee or a meal, to stand around the water cooler. Every office I've been in, there has been a space which was taken over by the social uh, aspect of things rather than anything else. Because as a species, we need to interact with each other. We need to, to hear the news and to pass the news on. I don't, you know, the, the sort of classic office thing, I don't know what Bill's doing today, but he just said to me X and, and, and everyone then can, you know, can handle that and deal with it. People want to hear news and pass it on. We are naturally intrigued by gossip. And that can be friends and family as well. Um, keeping up to date on the family Zoom call with what nephews and nieces and son-in-law and grandkids are doing. We can't go and visit them at the moment, so it's more important than ever um, that we hear what's happening and social media is a good way to do it. Doing it online, it's no substitute, but it's, it allows us to keep going. So, what is social media? It's a phrase that we use, and I would argue that social media started two or 300 years ago. Um, what used to happen was that there would be a, an issue of whatever paper came out, the Times, the Scotsman or whatever, which almost everyone read. And if you wanted to comment on an article or on an editorial, which is more common, you would write a letter, take it to the, the post box. It would arrive 
in the days when the post was actually picked up regularly and, and delivered regularly, it would arrive and the next morning uh, there would be a flood of letters on things and the day after that there would be a flood of letters uh, responding to those things. It was social media. It was very heavily filtered by the editorial team, but it was a way to interact. Some people argue that the first social media was when the telegram started, because it allowed us to communicate quickly, though very expensively, right across the world. And uh, there's a story in my wife's family that when the, her uncle, her late uncle, emigrated to Australia, uh, after the long crossing, he sent a telegram to two or three people saying, arrived safely, all fine. Not exactly those words, but in those days you paid by the word for telegrams. So he sent a very short telegram, and that was a way of keeping in touch. Social media as we know it now, which was an online thing, started when, in 1969, when, <laughs> I were but a lad, um, when the first links between a couple of American universities uh, were put together with something called ARPANET. And that allowed them to start tying what they were doing together and invented the internet. And the first proper online site, as we know it now, was Friendster. <clears throat> then came things like Friends Reunited and all the rest of it. Um, and then Mr. Zuckerberg invented Facebook. It was originally for a fairly closed group, but it kind of exploded. We'll come back to that. So taking the definition that I, that I found online, social media, websites and computer programs that allow people to communicate and share information on the internet using a computer or mobile phone. No mention of tablets, interestingly, but that's what the, that's the definition that I came across, and it's a pretty good starting point. So there are multiple social networks. Facebook, everyone's heard of. Twitter um, is very useful because it's very immediate. Um, there are, you know, politicians, economists, social commentators, and I will call him the last president of the USA because I'm not going to say his name in polite company. Um, there were a lot of people who uh, who used Twitter and you know for very immediate effect, uh, and it's very very useful for that and allows people to communicate um, and to comment on communication. LinkedIn is sort of like Facebook for professionals. It allows people in various industries to, to keep in touch, to track job moves, to advertise jobs, to apply for jobs, and so on. Instagram is, does something similar for photographs. Um, I've got an Instagram account, and I, I follow various photographers, and some follow me. Um, and it's, it's what it is. And each of these, if you look at the little diagram there, each of these social networks if you're in multiple of these social networks, you are communicating with vast numbers of people. And that means that vast numbers of people can see what you're doing and saying, and they can aggregate that information if you're not a little bit careful. But they are ways of connecting. They are, they are the traditional way of working now, because particularly for uh, things like LinkedIn, it is the way that we can link to people. Um, when I was working, um, I used to have a huge network of contact, contacts, clients, companies who supplied um, products and services to, to my clients and so on. And by, by using LinkedIn, I managed to track all the, the sales and technical people as they moved from company to company, and it was always intriguing to find out what was going on. <coughs> but let's look at Facebook, because that's what most people think, what I think about when you're talking about social networking. It was launched, would you believe, only 17 years ago in a fairly closed group and has opened up to the point where 
almost everyone that you know can be found on Facebook, sometimes trying to hide from some people is a bit of an issue. Um, and I know people who are being pestered by school friends they would rather have not remembered because it's now the largest network in the world. 2.5 billion people using it every month, but it does draw criticism because um, it has a political skew to it in that cer certain kinds of things um, will attract censure and certain kind of things will be completely ignored. Uh, and this has caused all kinds of issues in various places. And it will continue to do so because it is impossible for any social network to be completely neutral on social, political, economic, whatever issues. As soon as they try and enforce any degree of standards, whatever they do is going to attract criticism from somebody. And then we have the media sharing sites, Instagram, YouTube, which I talked about um, regularly. And I, I, I look at YouTube every single day to see what, um, what Google are suggesting I might want to watch. Snapchat for chatting, Vimeo for, for more professional uh, videos, places you can share things. And I have to say, particularly since most of them are, are you can use them all free, some of the videos that are on YouTube and Vimeo are absolutely superb. I'm following, for instance, the Time Team. Those of you of a certain age will remember Time Team used to do a lot of archaeological work. Well, they're coming back together and watching what they're planning and what they've been doing and, and also looking back all on YouTube, excellent. And if you've got time to go browsing through Vimeo, the production quality and the actual technical quality of the videos on, on Vimeo are absolutely brilliant. And increasingly, this is how people are publishing. Um, if you're foolish enough to watch Strictly Come Dancing, you'll keep on hearing people talking, you know, some of the contestants are social media influencers. These are people who have created their, you know, their fan base, their fame, based on what they've done on YouTube. Um, equally on TikTok, there's um, a, a, a female singer uh, called Natalie Natty, um, who has just started singing at the start of lockdown, would uh, play a guitar and sing, and then moved forward to singing along with other people who wanted to sing with her. And her first album is now coming out solely based on the fact that she's got a wonderful voice um, and she's singing good songs and virally on TikTok, she became popular. It's free marketing. It's the way of doing things. Yes, you can pay to get adverts popped up in your feed, but equally, if you've got something that's interesting to, to say or, or to listen to or to watch, people will see it and will start to recommend it and share it. It's also free education, because for the exact same reason that you can pop onto any of these sites, and particularly YouTube, and find things. I think I gave the example of the Jewish Undertaker last week. Um, if you have got um, a 1977 Ford Escort and you need to change the clutch, Someone's got a video on how to, how to do that. And when I'm doing, the, uh, doing these talks, I'm regularly popping them out of YouTube to find what other people have said on the same thing and the, to try and get the more interesting messages for it. And believe me, there are more other social media sites than you could shake a stick at. Uh, Katie was talking about her pile of WhatsApp messages just before um, you were all, uh, admitted into, the, uh, into the, the Zoom call. WhatsApp is a social media app. In the exact same way, if you're on Apple, iMessage or Messages is um, anywhere that you can have one-to-one -one or one-to-many text chats, video chat, video swapping, whatever else, they are all social media. 
Then you get things like Reddit, which many of you will never heard, have heard of, but it's where the experts in particularly technical areas, whatever it is, will sit and chat, and it is solely text chat, but the information that you get from it is absolutely brilliant. But not everyone is on any of these, so you've got to go looking a little bit if you want to find something that a particular person is doing or about a particular topic, you might have to search a bit. But Reddit's a good one. There's also ones like Pinterest. Um, it's an interesting one, Pinterest, but for content curation. Uh, I come across it a couple of times, and in one, one discussion I had, somebody was making lace embroidery. And shared it all on Pinterest because globally people who are making lace embroidery and lace things have a, a I don't know you call it a channel or a group on Pinterest. It is very tightly focused on what those interests are, what you're interested in. Um, and I, I must admit, I don't know much about it, but having seen what, what she did and having heard other people talk about it, it's a social social media network too far for me, but a really good one for those that have particular interest, interests. I did have a, a channel on Tumblr, which is purely for blogging, and anything in any interesting places that I went, I was putting photographs, particularly any of the archaeological sites I was on, and I started to follow a number of archaeologists, and they started to follow me. But again, it became too time-consuming, so I would just back off a little bit. But all of these are social media. They are, they are particular types of social media for particular groups of people, and if they work for you, they are great. There are more ways of finding information, sharing information, and communicating with each other now than there's ever been. It's great news, and it's bad news. So, the benefits. Well, the first benefit is it does allow us to reduce social isolation. And it's not just a lockdown social socialization, try that again in English, it's not just a lockdown social isolation, um, but if you're the only person who was interested in 17th century manuscripts, you're not going to find many people down the local Tesco's who will share that interest. But by going into social media, you can find other people and you will find that they've got a lot of information and access to information and can point you to things. So it's a way of your special interest actually becoming a, a, a way to communicate and share with people and it allows you then to make new friends with similar interests and it allows that education, the, the, both the social and practical education to be improved. And each of us know things that others don't, even if we think we don't know anything, we will all have read or heard or remembered something or have put various things together and sharing that, even if it's just as a theory, allows us to contribute to other people's knowledge as well as finding out theirs because it's raising aware awareness all the time. <clears throat> but the people that we're talking to, are they who they seem to be? Because all the time, and I've, I think this week has been a particularly bad week on Twitter, um, there have been hordes of people on various forums that I've been on and, and various conversations that I've been on who are obviously, when you go digging, completely bogus. Uh, and how they get there is a big issue, and I'm not going to get dragged into that for just now. But you really cannot assume that people are who they seem to be. On Facebook in particular, but on any of the social networks, you cannot trust a profile name or picture. If you get a message or you, at somebody contacts you to add you as a friend and it's called Colin Moss and they have my picture on it, it may be me. But equally, it might be somebody who has pinched my name and got a couple of photographs of me pretending to be me because they're going to try and 
scam somebody out of money, either you or somebody in your contacts list. You cannot necessarily trust a profile name or a picture. So when somebody contacts you to say, I'm Colin Moss, what I, what I would advise you to do is to say, that's great, Colin, nice to see you again. Um, can you just remind me in that third talk you did, what did you mean by X? Ask something that only the real person will know. And they're, if they're real, they'll be, they'll be able to answer. And if they're not real, they'll suddenly go quiet or they'll start talking about, oh, I can't help you just now. I'm in Paris and had all my money stolen. And can you send me 20,000 pounds, please? Because there is no verification needed to create a profile. Facebook do try, and they will try by um, emailing the email address that you say is yours when you're creating it. But there's nothing to stop somebody setting up um, a bogus email address. Happens all the time. Gmail is full of it, as is Outlook. Profile, uh, profile scam email addresses are only set up in order to, uh, to allow them to set up profiles in somebody's name. And this comes back to something we'll talk about in the, the scams talk, never giving away data that allows people to, to represent themselves as you or apply for loans or credit cards in your name. Because if it's suspicious, check. If, if somebody comes happen to, um, as one of one of the ministry students that um, that we had in the church many years ago suddenly popped up in my feed, which was absolutely fascinating, given that I'd been talking to him in the morning um, on on Facebook Messenger about something that we're doing jointly. But some suddenly someone um, someone came up with his name, uh, but with, a, with on a different address. So I just contacted him. Uh, and said, hey, Cammy, is, you know, is this you? And he said, oh, no, not again. So he, he reported it. But check. Um, bump into the person, pick up the phone, message them something. But if it's suspicious, be cautious. There are things called verified profiles. Um, Twitter and Facebook, they have a blue tick beside the person's name. And if you go onto Twitter and if you're clever enough to find me because I'm, I don't use my real name on Twitter because I'm not that stupid, um, you'll find that I've got a blue tick beside my name. If you come across somebody that purports to be someone, someone, they will have a huge number of followers if they are important or famous. But even then, that does not mean that that, that account hasn't been hacked, so be cautious. Equally, if they have been hacked, the person could be real, but the message could be faked. And it, I've seen this quite often on Facebook that you're in the middle of a conversation, then all of a sudden somebody, you know, somebody who hasn't been active on Facebook suddenly pops up um, and there it's quite, you know, the language is different. Uh, and when you look at it, it's obvious that they're, they're on some sort of scam, typically looking for money. And all that's happened is that they've been using an insecure password on their Facebook and the message could be faked. Now, again, we'll talk about this in the scams talk with, uh, shortly, but there's a website called Have I Been Pawned? And it's, I'll, you'll get, I'll give you the link at, um, in, at the end of it. I'll put it in the, the messages that go with this. And it allows you to put your email address or each of your email addresses into um, a website and they will tell you if your email address has been hacked at any time. For instance, the big British Airways hack uh, not long ago, but various other ones. And they will tell you that your email address, your username have maybe have been hacked. Your password is a common one to get hacked your credit card details, whatever else. You should only have one password for one site. You should not be using the same password on multiple sites. And the more critical sites that you're on, like Amazon, like Facebook, like your bank, you should have a complex password 
um, and it should be remembered for you. And that's, we're moving on to another topic, but just be cautious because every profile can be hacked. And if you use the same password in multiple places, sooner or later, it's going, someone's going to try and hack you. Um, I had an email from Amazon on Thursday or Friday of last week wanting to confirm that I was trying to log on from Turkey. And if I wasn't, could I please change my complex password to a new one? That took me 30 seconds because there's no way that I was going to risk my Amazon account. And things can get hacked. It's nothing that you do wrong as a rule, but equally you can do things that make it more likely. What to do is to, to, to have your personal details set up in such a way that you're not exposed. And I say we'll talk about that in, in our scams awareness course, but there, there are various ways of just being cautious. So moving slightly on, intent versus impact. What I said was that, and I hadn't realized that whatever was the consequence. And it's easy to make a mistake. It's very easy to be responding in a group and to reply to a message and to reply to everybody in the group rather than the one person you met. And we gave that example last week. Um, it's very, it's almost impossible to undo that kind of mistake. And the, the red face factor can be absolutely spectacular. And I actually watched someone do it in an office once and they went absolutely crimson because they'd been talking about the boss and sent the message to the boss by accident. It's very easy when you're trying to do something and I watched a, a senior politician to um, do it just in the last 48 hours. They meant to send a direct message to one of their um, one of their team, but accidentally put it up on a tweet, which meant it was public. And the one thing they didn't want was the public to know what they were what they were directing their staff to do rather than the staff direction. And no, I won't name that politician in one. Or sending it just to the wrong person. It's so easy to do. And again, it's a message we gave during, during the, um, the email topic. It's worthwhile just taking time. Your location. Your location is solid gold. Never post it. It's so easy to do accidentally that you've, you've given permission to an app to put your location on it. Um, you take a couple of photographs of um, that wonderful uh, display of plants in your back garden and put it up on Facebook or whatever. And you've not told Facebook to remove your location from it. Did you know that every photograph you take on a phone has got your detailed location right down to the latitude and longitude to within a couple of feet stamped in the picture. Unless you remove it, it's there. Your location is solid gold. Never go give away your current location or particularly your home address unless you mean to. Um, sometimes I'll do that when I'm on, on the way home. Um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just pop a, a thing saying, here's where I am, won't be long, that sort of message. Holidays, oh, well, the even more remote possibility now. It's a £5,000 £5, fine for even trying to go on holiday. But you shouldn't do the announcement thing. Um, one of the, the, the forums on Facebook, on which I'm a moderator, uh, regularly will get the, the countdown. I'm going on holiday in 27 days and four hours. And our standard response is, on behalf of the local criminal community, we thank you for telling us that your house is going to be vacant for those days. And regularly somebody will come back and say, no problem at all, you won't know where I live. And it will take one of the moderator team about five minutes to find their address and, and in a private message to send them a, a, a photo of their front door of Google Street View. If you announce your holidays, 
you're telling the world your house is going to be empty and no one's going to believe that your son with two Alsatians is going to be sitting there waiting for burglars. And there have been a number of cases and an increasing number of cases where homes which have been broken into when people have been on holiday, the insurers are not paying out anymore because you have, as far as they are concerned, if you've announced the house is empty, you've it's contributory negligence and they're just not going to pay for the, you know, for the break-in. Um, and I have to say, speaking of somebody that's, you know, that's slightly paranoid, I don't blame them very much for that. There is a thing called geotagging, and uh, I, if you've ever come across my Instagram account, you'll find multiple pictures where I've actually put a geotag on the pictures to allow people to find that feature, that area, the access to that site, to that garden or whatever, because it's been a very, very useful thing. You can take that geotag, hit the hit navigate to and whatever sat nav app or Google Maps or Apple Maps, whatever you do, will take you to it. Geotagging is wonderful, used properly, but you can overshare. Nobody needs to know the, the things that you're doing. And I, I know of people who put what I would say is absolutely ridiculous stuff on their, um, on their, their feed on Facebook. Uh, and they put far too much about how they're feeling and how the kids are and what the neighbor's doing. Because if you get too relaxed and you overshare, there are all kinds of dangers. But equally, somebody was, you know, somebody was on a on a forum, and this is Katie picked this one up. Someone saying, Elvis died on my 14th birthday. Great. So now we've got your date of birth. We know your name. As long as we can get an address for you, <coughs> pardon me, which won't be hard, I'll get the credit card and your name sent to my house very quickly and get a loan in your name. You've given away some of the key information. The only thing that, that you could do worse than that is to give away the 16-digit number on the front of your credit card. Now, this was posted on a public Facebook page. And I'll let you try and work out why it maybe wasn't a good idea uh, and maybe you would want to reflect on it. Very easy to do. I have to say this is one that Katie found, not me. And anybody can do it. You're so busy taking the photograph that you don't look at the background. And it's the same as um, on social media, uh, on sorry, on video calls, you're very careful what's in the background. When you're taking photographs, just look around you because you might be giving away a lot of information by accident about where you are. You might have a letter lying on a table that somebody can pick up an address from, and I've seen that done. You just got to be cautious. So you've made a mistake and you want to erase a something you've put up. Do you really want to delete it? Well, is it ever really gone? No. All that happens if you on Twitter or Facebook or wherever else, if you try and delete something, you're not actually deleting it. It's not going it. You're ju it's just being flagged as not visible. Even to, um, to administrators, for instance, if they delete a post or you delete a post, they can't see it, but believe me, Facebook can. There's something called a Wayback Machine. And what it does is it's perpetually grabbing images of sites. And if you delete something from Facebook or Twitter or wherever else, on Wayback Machine, you can go back and look at that page the way it was. Somebody may have screenshotted it at the time it was up. And again, I know of examples of that. Somebody posts something up that they suddenly realize is problematic. Uh, and there was a case actually yesterday, and this one's going to get messy. Um, somebody made a, a comment about the opinion of a QC 
and accused them of something. Um, and they immediately got a, um, a warning letter from the QC's legal team saying, you do realize this is a QC, that this is a qualified legal opinion, um, and that what you've just posted is, is defamatory. They deleted it. They deleted their, their scurrilous comment immediately. Um, but the legal team are on it, and they're not going to let the person off with it. So just sometimes being quiet is best. Search engines, and we talked about spiders last week, if the spider has crawled over something uh, and found your post, even if you delete it, even if you delete it, the search engine will still have it, and the search engine will be throwing up what you posted for quite some time in the you know in in Google or in Bing or in DuckDuckGo. They'll be popping that up as as we go, and you can't undo it. You can't get back to them and say, "Please remove that. I've deleted the post. It's there." So you do have to think. Whatever you're doing, think twice. Cool down. What is the impact of it? If I say this, how will other people how will other people see it? No matter how upset or angry or confused I am, um, what's going to happen? And equally check your grammar, because sometimes a misplaced comma or a typo, um, don't rather than do, for instance, that can have immeasurable consequences and saying oh it was a typo if you've seriously upset somebody and not a very good defense make sure you're not putting any private information up by accident we talked about that but it happens all the time um, and it was a game that that one of the other admins and i used to play on the facebook group people would you know when you said you've got to be more careful they would they would start to say um, oh, people can never find me. And he and I, he being in Germany, me being in Edinburgh, would have a, a little game to see who could most quickly get a lot of private information on that person. Not doing anything illegal, but just using a couple of search engines and knowing where to look. And if we can do it, being you know non-techy but just savvy people, think what a real hacker can do. And it's down to privacy. Now, Facebook's privacy settings are pretty good as long as you check them. I've got my posts on Twitter set in such a way that only my friends can see something and comment on it. Friends of friends can see it but can't comment on it, but that's it. So it means that if anybody else out there who is not a friend of a friend tries to find anything, they can't. And more to the point, they can't share it. I share things with my friends. They can share it with their friends, but if their friends try and share it, it vanishes. I've no idea how Facebook do it, but that's how, it, how I've got it set up. Facebook have got a huge amount of privacy settings. And bless their little cotton socks, they keep on changing how they work. So what I do is every, every few months, two or three times a year, I go in and I go back through all the privacy settings and I think about each one carefully. And usually I don't make any changes, but sometimes I do because they sometimes have a habit of moving their settings around or splitting a setting in two and assuming what they thought I meant by when in fact they've, they've changed the way it works. So just... Take your time with it. Facebook and Google as well have got a privacy checkup you can run, and it will tell you what the consequences of your decisions are. But before you post anything or share anything, please just check. Instagram, Twitter, all of these sites have got different settings, different ways of keeping private, different ways of keeping secure because they're aware that there are some bad actors out there who are trying to get hold of your data. Because you want to be sure that you're in control of who can see what you post and who can find you online. Don't, for instance, let Facebook 
know what your mobile number is. And if they do know your mobile number for any reason, make sure you've set it that it can't be searched. Otherwise, you can suddenly find yourself getting phone calls or texts or whatever else from somebody who claims to be a friend or who claims to be telling you your internet's about to be cut off. Only had one of these calls today. Um, and the more information that you have out there and the more you allow it to be shared, the, you know, the more at risk you could find yourself. And who can see your profile? If you who do not know me go searching for me by my name, um, you'll actually find a lot of references to a South African actor of the same name uh, and a, a doctor, is it, I think, down Leeds direction. But you won't find out very much about me on Facebook. And if you do, please let me know, um, because it means that the settings have changed behind my back again. And when you're doing searches for names on Facebook, it should just come up with, at the most, a name but no profile, no picture, no nothing. You want to be as invisible as you can, unless you're an actor or a doctor. Security is critical, and the way to, to keep your account secure is to keep your password changed. Don't leave your password the same for too long. Make it a complex one and change it as often as you can. And we'll talk about this in the, in the, uh, the scams one use some sort of password manager. Some of them are free, some of them are paid for, and they're all good. Um, as an Apple user, I don't have a paid one because Apple have got it all baked into the, um, into the operating system and my passwords just flow from device to device as I change them. I changed the, my Amazon password after uh, the hack attempt from Turkey last week. And immediately when I went on my iPad, I could log back into my Amazon account because this, uh, the password had securely changed on the, the iPad. Consider two-factor authentication. And what that means is, is on my Amazon account, for instance, anytime I try and log into Amazon, they will send me a number, which I've then got to key in to, um, into the website before I'm even allowed to access it. And that is sent as, a, as a, an SMS message to my phone, no matter what device I'm trying to log in on. And it means that it's a little bit more difficult to get hacked. So, keeping secure. Do you really want to give people your date of birth? Well, if you've got to put your date of birth into a website, why not a fake one? Um, I have done this on one website, which I was dubious about. Um, and I remembered the date of birth of one of my friends. And I used his date of birth, albeit my name, because that made it a little bit less likely that they could come back to bite me if there was something going on. Never share your, your location. But sometimes your past location could be something you want to hide as much as your current location. Just keep these things to yourself. Phone number we've talked about. And if you've got a landline as well as a, as a mobile, try and keep those numbers uh, as private as you can as well. Otherwise, you're going to get the... Uh, this morning, my wife had a phone call saying that, that, that the Amazon order, which was for £199, uh, it was about to be delivered, blah, blah, blah. And of course, there was no Amazon order at all, but they've got our phone number somewhere. So that's something we've got to deal with. It happens all the time. So in summary, social media is a huge benefit. It really is. It allows us to communicate, to share, to educate. It allows us to, to sit and have a coffee with friends. And it's as easy to have coffee with a friend who is across the street as across the world. My wife regularly now is having chats with her cousin in Brisbane because um, the cousin's mother isn't that well. Um, and were it not for time difference, they would also bring the aunt in Canada in, but my wife chats to her as well. It's, it's a way of doing things we could never do before.
but unmanaged, it is disastrous and it can have untold consequences if we're not careful. It can change your life. It will change your life for better or worse. It's down to each of us to make sure that it changes it for the, for the better rather than for worse. It's down to each of us just to have that extra degree of care and caution. 